Hi, I'm Claire Hadfield and I'm a lecturer in English and Education at Plymouth Marjon University. I'm going to be speaking to you today about the poem My Last Duchess by Robert Browning, which is actually one of my favourite poems now to teach when I used to teach in secondary schools from the Power and Conflict Anthology. However, it can be really off-putting, I think, at first glance, especially for, you know, if you're 15, 14 years old and you're looking at this poem for the first time. Um, it's very long. It takes a page and a half in your, in your anthology. It's not even broken up into stanzas. It's one long piece of text and the language and the syntax are unusual and familiar and can be quite off-putting. However, um, it is one of my favourite poems to teach and also to explore with the trainee teachers that I work with. And the reason I think really is that it's not until you start going into the detail and unpicking this poem that you realise how kind of deliciously sinister it is. At first glance, you probably don't immediately understand the, the nature of the Duke and the Duchess and their relationship and how... Um, how skewed that is, how uneven that is. I also think that the poem does deal with, although it's from, uh, you know, set in, in the 16th century, obscure place, obscure time, people you've probably never heard of before, it actually tackles really universal and easily relatable emotions and very dark emotions that are common to all of us, no matter where we come from and the time that we live in. Um, jealousy, resentment and barely suppressed rage. And these emotions are not just unique to this poem, My Last Duchess. Browning also explores such dark, the dark side of human nature in uh, two other poems in particular come to mind in The Laboratory, um, which is again about jealousy and revenge and Porphyria's lover. So in all, if you really want to expand your wider contextual knowledge of Browning and his work, I would suggest starting with those two poems, which are easily accessible. So obviously the poems within the Power and Conflict collection, and I want to talk to you about aspects of power and aspects of conflict in this particular poem. And in particular, between, in the relationship between the Duke and the Duchess, his last Duchess. Um, so based speculation is that it's based on an actual real life case of um, a duke from a very powerful old Italian family who married someone who was about 11 or 12 years younger. He quickly seemed to become tired of her and she um, was I think about 17 years old when she then eventually died and some thought in mysterious circumstances there were rumours that she had been poisoned because the duke had just got tired of her. Um, so Browning uses this form of dramatic monologue to really give us an insight into the sinister manipulative mind of the Duke. So let's think about aspects of power in relation to the Duke. He has a title. He's a member of the aristocracy. He owns a castle. He's conspicuously wealthy. See, he has servants. He has an art gallery in his house. How, how many people have that? Um, so all of those things give him power and they are ways of him demonstrating his power and his social status. He's a man, uh, so he has male privilege. He's able to handpick his wife from other similarly powerful families and wealthy families. And he's able to demand a dowry, a sum of money that will come with his wife when she marries him. Um, he is conspicuously wealthy and he enjoys showing off and boasting about that wealth. He employs well-known artists and sculptures, so he name drops in this poem. Uh, he uses the title Fra Pandolf. Uh, Fra was a sign of respect. It was to suggest that this particular painter he'd employed was not just any old painter, he was a master painter. He was really well known, he was really talented. So the Duke is saying to the person who he's showing around his gallery, look, I employ the best. Uh, likewise with Klaus of Innbruck, he references at the end of the poem. So both of these people are, are not real, then they are invented characters, but they're a way of the Duke demonstrating uh, on purpose his wealth and his power and his status. 
He's also older than, than the previous Duchess, and his age gives him a certain amount of power and authority as well. And an age gap relationship we know is never, not never, it's really even in terms of the power distribution. There's always going to be one person in that relationship or perhaps both people who feel insecure for different reasons. And that seems to be the case very much so in this relationship. So that leads me on to the idea of conflict in the poem. So there's a clash or there's conflict between the Duke and the Duchess and in particular around their expectations of marriage. So the Duke, because of his status, because of his wealth, expects gratitude from his, his young wife. He expects deference. He wants her to show him the respect that he considers he is due. So we see this when he talks about his 900 years old name that he's gifted to her. And he's really annoyed that she doesn't seem to appreciate exactly how much of a favour he's doing to her by marrying her. So she doesn't respond as he expects to this gift of a name. He then becomes increasingly resentful and angry, but he refuses to express this. He says this would be stooping. He'd be lowering himself to her level if he gave in and kind of said, you know what, I'm really, I'm really a bit resentful. I'm really a bit fed up about the way in which you smile at everybody. I want your smiles just to be for me. I'm really fed up about the fact that, you know, the little mule that you ride around the yard seems to be just as much um, a pleasurable experience as being with me. Um, but he doesn't do that. So this then just becomes this vicious cycle of resentment of the Duke towards the Duchess. And this is what leads us, I think, to the kind of climax of the poem in a way, the sinister and mysterious line or the little section that starts with the line, I gave commands. So this is deliberately ambiguous. We don't know exactly what the Duke means here. And Browning leaves us to kind of infer what might have happened to the Duchess. So there's a sense of mystery. So how has this conflict been resolved exactly? What were the commands that he gave? How has he used his power to somehow resolve this situation with his Duchess? Who has become his last Duchess? He's now in the market for a new Duchess. So what's happened here? And Browning deliberately doesn't tell us this. He creates this sense of mystery. And that's one of the things I really like about the poem is all of a sudden at that point, the reader or the listener pauses for thought and thinks, hang on a minute, something's not right here. So a mystery is created and it's maintained in the form and the language of the poem. So we know that the poem is a dramatic monologue. We get one point of view and the listener is silent. OK, so there is a listener. The Duke is showing around this uh, kind of servant of the, the Count um, who's waiting downstairs for him, showing him around the gallery. This, this servant is, is the Duke's social inferior, inferior, so he's not going to interrupt him anyway. But the Duke's language actually inadvertently gives quite a lot away. And I think this little section where he says, um, uh, I gave commands and then um, he returns to the line looking as if she were alive, at that point, you could almost think, you could almost imagine him as being a bit lost in thought. Or like, oh, there she is. Yeah, she, she almost looks as though she could be alive there. And, and then I think he almost, he remembers himself and perhaps realises that he's been a little bit indiscreet about the fact that he's given commands and she's no longer alive. Um, so then there's an abrupt change of tone. He... Uh, instructs the, his listener, the person who's accompanying him around the gallery, says, oh, shall, shall we get up and go now? Uh, and, and it's as though he, he realises he's gone too far. So they move on through the gallery uh, and, and back downstairs then eventually to the unnamed Count who's waiting below, but not before um, the Duke. He can't resist one final flourish um, talking about his... Um, bronze statue that was cast by Klaus of Innbruck. So again, he's he's back to his boastful self. So his mood has changed. Uh, and all the while now, we're aware at the end of the poem that there, there is someone downstairs who is about to marry his daughter off to the Duke. There's the next Duchess who's waiting downstairs. And because Browning has planted this seed of doubt in our mind about what happened to the previous Duchess, 
the sinister mood is maintained we are almost wanting i think at this point to kind of say don't do it don't do it to to the duch to the to the potential duchess who's waiting below um so the count's unsuspecting daughter is is potentially going to become the next duchess of ferrara and who knows what her fate will be so this is why i really like this poem i think that it creates just enough of a sense of mystery um to intrigue and engage us and deals with emotions that are absolutely relatable to anybody from any time and place. <laughs>